Hi guys. <coughs> How are you guys today? I uh, I hope that you've had a great week. Um, I want to thank you for joining me here again this morning, and um, I believe that uh, this is going to be a great message. Um, <laughs> that kind of kind of sounds yeah, anyway. I think it's going to be we're going to have a good time here. Uh, happy Father's Day to you dads out there. And um, before we start, I just uh, would like to open in a quick word of prayer. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to be here today. I thank you, God, that you are uh, the God who saves. You are the God who redeems. You are the God who heals. You are you are God of all. Lord, I just ask that you would uh, anoint me here this morning to speak. I pray, God, that you would give me the words to speak, the attitude, the spirit about it that needs to be spoken. Um, I ask that those who are are listening today or tomorrow or any other day, I pray that their hearts and their minds would be open to receive what you have to say today, oh God. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would guide us through the next few moments. I pray that uh, everything said here would glorify you, and we just thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if I can have you open your Bibles to Luke. Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 37. Luke 11, 37. And I want to speak a message to you today that I've entitled, Who Will You Be? Who Will You Be? So in Luke 11, starting in verse 37, the scriptures read this way. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and he took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by the Jewish custom. Then the Lord said to him, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy. You're full of greed and wickedness. Fools, didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? Now if we jump to verse 53, the scriptures continue on and it says this, As Jesus was leaving, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees became hostile, and they tried to provoke him with many questions. They wanted to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. Now, a few months ago, I was watching this series on Netflix, and, and the whole series was a docu-series, and they were interviewing murderers. And so they were interviewing them, asking them what happened, what motivated them, those kind of things. And anyway, as I was watching this, it became very clear that there were two types of people in this documentary. There were two types. There were those who accepted what they had done. They accepted that they had made a terrible decision in their life. They had made a horrible choice. It affected those around them. It affected themselves. It ruined their life, this choice. They accepted what they had done, and they were sorry for what they had done. But then there was another group. And those other groups of people had a much different response in these interviews. They would blame their parents for their upbringing. They would blame bullies. They would blame the judicial system. They would blame all sorts of things. Basically, what they were doing is they were placing blame on everything they could so that they did not have to take responsibility for their own action. They refused to take responsibility for doing what they had done. They failed to realize that they were being punished because they were ultimately the ones who pulled the trigger. They were ultimately the ones who swung the knife. They were ultimately the ones who did the crime. They failed to realize that. See, I wonder how many people, I wonder how many people there are that simply refuse to accept responsibility for their own actions. I fear that in our culture, in our society, that number continues to grow and grow daily of people who are simply not responsible for their own decisions. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit will come and convict us for doing wrong. The Holy Spirit will convict us as believers when He does not want us to step out and do something, or He doesn't want us to say something, or He'll convict us and we can feel that conviction for doing wrong. But there are, there are two people, there are two kinds of people rather in this world. There are those who, who feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and heed that conviction. 
they are repentive of what they've done. But then there are those who will try to skirt responsibility and blame everybody else they can for the decisions that they made on their own. So today, I want to take a few moments and I want you to examine yourself as we work our way through this message. I want you to ask yourself this simple question. Who will you be when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes? Who will you be? Because the reality is, is the Holy Spirit will convict every genuine believer. Every believer in Christ will be convicted by the Holy Spirit from time to time. But it's very important how we react and how we respond. And the question is, how will you respond? In Luke 30, 11, rather, in Luke 11, verse 37, it says, As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So we went in and he took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. Now, when we begin to work our way down through this text, there's something that becomes very, very clear here. What becomes very clear is that the Pharisees were offended by Jesus before they even had a conversation. So they invite him in to sit down and to talk to him. But before that conversation with Jesus even started, the Pharisees were already offended. They had already set their mind on what they believed and what they thought about Jesus. In this chapter, just a quick recap, during this chapter, Jesus is performing miracles. And he cast out this demon. And the Pharisees look at him and they say, He's casting out demons by the power of Satan. They had already determined in their hearts that Jesus was a bad guy. That they, that they weren't going to follow this guy's teachings. That they didn't believe what was happening through, through Jesus. So not only that, so after Jesus basically challenges them on this belief, then they challenge him and they say, you know what? Then if you truly are from God, then do more signs. Do more wonders. You need to do more and more. See, their heart was not right. They had already determined in their heart that Jesus was not who he said he was. So now they've invited him to the home. He's come to the home, and the first thing they do in their hearts is grumble and complain, and they're shocked because he didn't wash his hands the way that they wanted him to. See, their mind was already made up, and I wonder if it's possible that there are many, many people today who already have their minds made up about a certain choice in their life or, or about what they believe. And, and their mind is already made up before the Holy Spirit even convicts them. So before the Holy Spirit even convicts them that their choices in life are wrong, they're already convinced that there's nothing wrong with it. Before, before the Holy Spirit convicts them about what they believe on a certain doctrine or a certain theology, they've already made their mind up what they believe and they refuse to budge. I wonder how many people are just like that. See, in Galatians 5.16 it says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature desires. In Romans 8 verse 14 it says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So the question is this, how can we be led by the Spirit of God if we are already determined to fight against His leading before He even starts a work in our life? How can we be led by the Spirit of God into truth if we're already determined that we know the truth? How can we be led into a life of righteousness if we're already determined that there's nothing wrong with the choices we're making anyway? How can we be led? See, I wonder how many people struggle in their Christian walk because they've already made up their mind what they believe. They already made up their mind what they deem as acceptable behavior. And they're not even willing to, to be led by the Spirit of God. Question is this, who do you want to be when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes? That's what really matters. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be someone who's already made up your mind? You've already made up your mind what you believe. You've already made up your mind what choices you're going to make in life. 
before the Holy Spirit even convicts you? Is that who you want to be? Or do you want to be somebody who the Holy Spirit can guide and teach? Do you want to be somebody who the Holy Spirit can mold and shape into the person that God's created you to be? Who will you be when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes? In Luke eleven thirty nine, 39, it says, Then the Lord said to him, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup, <clears throat> the cup and the dish, but inside you're filthy. You're full of greed and you're full of wickedness. See, Jesus saw the issue. He saw that they were, they were challenging him. He saw the heart issue before they even spoke. And so he challenges that. He challenges that the very moment he sees it. See, this is what the Holy Spirit does in our life. The moment the Holy Spirit begins to see us uh, um, exhibiting behavior or actions that is going to threaten to destroy us, whether it's physically or spiritually, He begins to convict us. When He begins to, to see that in our heart and in our mind, we're already determining things that is going to do nothing but harm us, God is already sending His Spirit to convict us. Could it be that if you're never ever challenged by the Holy Spirit, if, you're, if you never actually feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, is it possible that maybe you're not listening to the Holy Spirit? In Luke eleven forty two, 42, it says this, What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. What sorrow awaits you, Pharisees? For you love to sit in the seats of honor in the synagogue, and you love to receive respectful greetings as you walk in the marketplace. Yes, what sorrow awaits you? For you are like hidden graves in the field. People walk over them without even knowing the corruption that they're stepping on. Teacher, said the expert in religious law, you have insulted us in what you have said. That word insulted is also uh, translated in some translations as offended. They said, teacher, you offended us by what you said. See, Jesus is telling the Pharisees that they tithe and they, and they take honor in public places. And, 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 but he compares them to these hidden graves. See, what he's doing is he's challenging their prideful nature. He's challenging them. He's challenging them. He's saying, listen, you act as though you are something you are not. You are acting so high and mighty. You are acting so great that there could never be something wrong with you, that everybody else is the issue. And he's saying, you're acting like you are so perfect, yet inside you are nothing but a corrupt grave. And look at their response. Jesus challenges them. And what's their response? You offended me. You offended me. That's the response. See, I wonder if this is becoming a common response to the conviction of God in our day as well. I wonder if it didn't just stop back there with the Pharisees a couple thousand years ago. I wonder if maybe that response is actually becoming more and more prevalent and becoming more and more of a problem. Could it be that there are far more people who go to church and are offended by the Holy Spirit rather than being convicted by the Holy Spirit. When the pastor stands up and challenges lifestyles, when the pastor stands up and challenges thought processes, when the, when the, when the pastor stands up and challenges and the conviction of the Holy Spirit begins to settle in that place, I wonder how many people are walking out of there offended by what the pastor said and going home and complaining rather than being convicted by the Holy Spirit of God and re-examining their lives. See, Jesus then continues, he continues to challenge their hypocrisy. In verse 47, he says, What sorrow awaits you? For you build monuments for the prophets, your own ancestors, who your own ancestors killed long ago. But in fact, you stand as witnesses who agree with what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you join in their crime by building the monuments. The Pharisees thought they were good enough. The Pharisees thought they had it all together. They were doing everything right in their own eyes. They had it all figured out. They're walking around like they had it all together. 
and there was no need for God to transform them. God needed to transform all those other people, not them. Where do you stand today? Where do you stand in all this? Are you still willing allow, to allow God to show you what he wants you to become? Or are you satisfied with who you are? Are you willing to allow God to continue to challenge you and press you and push you to, to become more of, of who he wanted you to become and mold you and shape you? Are you, are you willing to allow him to point out those faults in your life, those things that are, that are unrighteous, those things that are, are not edifying? Are you willing to allow God to do that? Or are you going to stand and simply say, no, I'm fine the way I am and I don't need to change? Who do you want to be when the Holy Spirit's conviction comes? Do you want to be the person who thinks they have it all together? Do you want to be the person who thinks that you're just fine? Or do you want to be the person who humbles themselves before the Lord and says, God, I humbly submit to you. If this isn't supposed to be in my life, then it won't be. If I'm not supposed to think and act and, and talk this way, then I won't. Who are you going to be when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes? In Luke eleven fifty three, 53, it says, As Jesus was leaving, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees became hostile. They tried to provoke him with many questions. They wanted to trap him into saying something they could use against him. See, they refused to accept that they had faults. They refused to accept that something inside was not quite right. And instead, what they decided to do was deflect responsibility. They weren't the problem. Jesus was the problem. Jesus shouldn't be pointing them out. See, Jesus, in their eyes, was the problem for offending them. It wasn't them for doing what they were doing. I wonder how many times this happens today. People are living in a lifestyle that's destroying their lives. It's destroying them physically. It's destroying them mentally. It's destroying them spiritually. They're making choice after choice after choice as destroying them and those around them. But when they're challenged about their behavior, they attack the person that's pointing out the issue rather than addressing the problem themselves. This is deflection at its finest. I wonder how many people do that. When the Spirit, Holy Spirit convicts them, are they simply blaming the church for making them feel guilty? Are they simply blaming their, their friends or their loved ones or church members who are, who are trying to point out some of these issues? Are they simply blaming them as if they're all the problem when reality is what's going on inside is the true issue? In Luke 11, starting in verse 31, it says, The Queen of Sheba will stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it. For she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. The people of Nineveh will also stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the pre preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. Jesus points out two things here to the Pharisees. He says, you refuse to listen. And he said, you refuse to repent. You refuse to listen and you refuse to repent. I wonder how many people that are hearing this today, that the Holy Spirit has convicted you, but you refuse to change your mind. You refuse to change. You're, you say, no, I, I won't do it. I'm fine the way I am. Or no, you're wrong. I don't believe what you're saying. They refuse to listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying. And then they refuse to repent. They refuse to change. Even when it becomes obvious. Even when, when whoever has been challenging them has a pretty good point. They refuse to change. They refuse to repent. See, in Acts 2, starting at verse 37, it says this, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and the, others, the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? See, this crowd had gathered at the day of Pentecost when they heard all this commotion. And Peter comes out and he challenged them. 
He challenged their sin. He challenged them from murdering Christ on the cross. He challenged their thoughts. He challenged their behavior. And these men and these people, they stood before him and they said, what must we do? They didn't refuse to listen. They didn't refuse to change. In fact, they did the exact opposite. They listened to what Peter said and then they said, what must we do? What must we do? They accepted the responsibilities of their actions. So my question for you today is this. Who do you want to be when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes? Who do you want to be? Are you going to be the person who deflects blame onto someone else? Are you going to be the person that when the conviction of God comes, whether it's through, a, through somebody he uses or through a pastor at the church or, or, or a sermon online or, or maybe it's from reading the Bible, who are you going to be? When the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes, are you just going to blame somebody else for your behavior? Are you going to blame your parents? Are you going to blame your upbringing? Are you going to blame the church you go to? Are you going to, are you going to blame the government? Are you going to, who are you going to blame? Are you going to be the person that blames everybody else for your decisions and for your choices? Or are you going to be the one who accepts responsibility for your own actions? That you accept responsibility that your thought life isn't very good. You accept responsibility that your, your heart isn't very, very good. You accept responsibility that your behaviors lately, they weren't very good. Who are you going to be when the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes? This is where we're going to conclude. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to be a part of every genuine Christian life. If there is no conviction, if there is no challenge in our lives at all, we really need to take a step back and we need to examine ourselves. Because if we don't think that the Holy Spirit needs to do a work in us, if we don't think that the Holy Spirit uh, needs to convict us of, of any sin or wrong thinking or wrong actions, we may have a deeper issue there. The reality is, is that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all sin, we all make mistakes. And so my, my question is this, if, if there's no conviction of that sin, then are you listening to the Holy Spirit? We need to guard our hearts from pride. Guarding our, our pride, rather, will cause us to ignore the voice of God. When you think that you've got it all together, when you think that you know it all, when you think that you're perfect, then you're never going to listen to the voice of God when he, when he contradicts that thought. We need to guard our hearts against pride. We need to humble ourselves. We need to accept that we're not perfect. And we're in need of a Savior. So this week's challenge is simple. I want you to listen for the voice of God. I want you to listen for the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life. And I want you to ask yourself this, and I want to challenge you today. When the Holy Spirit convicts you, when the conviction comes, who will you be? Who will you be? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you. Um, I thank you for who you are. I thank you, God, that your conviction means that you're not giving up on us. Lord, you still see things in us. Um, you still see promise in us. You still see, God, that there is more of who we could become than what we are. God, you see, you see us for who we are and who we can become, rather, not, not who we are now. And so, God, sometimes we as, as Christians and we as people, sometimes, Lord, we, we don't... Uh, we don't give ourselves, or give you rather, enough credit. Lord, sometimes we feel like we're never going to change, or that we can never become who, who we know that you've called us to become. But thank God we don't have to do it on our own. Thank God that, Lord, when your Spirit convicts us, that you in the same time give us the strength to overcome. You don't leave us here with with our own strengths and our own ability to overcome these, 
these thoughts or overcome these, these heart issues or overcome these, these behavioral issues. Lord, you give us your spirit that we may become more than conquerors. Lord Jesus, you're so good to us. He said, God, I just ask if there be anyone hearing this today that's living a life or that's, that's not, not pleasing to you, that God, not only would you convict them, but God, that you would give them the strength to overcome this, to become who you called them to be. And we thank you in your name we pray. Amen. So until we meet again, whether it is here or in the rapture, may God bless you.